Um, I do think that we have some excitement starting very soon as actually Benjamin is going into, well, he declined to go into the Benoni, but we can take a quick look at Nicholas's game. Um, played g4 just now, so he's gearing up for that attack, as always. You said you're you're fairly close with uh, Bach and Theodoru. Uh, when did you guys like first meet? I don't actually remember when I first met Bach. Uh, I've known Nicholas just like very sort of. He and I used to have. Well, I he was my coach. Nick, not Nicholas. We used to have the same coach, or and he used to be Greek. So I think he, he used still to be plays. Greek. He, I think he's still Greek. What I meant to say <laughs> is that when I had my Greek coach. Um, I would run into him at tournaments, obviously. There is also a very lovely girl, um, Stavrula, who is on the SLU team, and she is also Greek. So I am friends with um, just a couple members of the Greek team, really. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Stavrula played last year in the CCL, Stavrula Solakido, um, whose chess.com username is actually a pun of her last name, so lucky though. Really? That's amazing. I yeah. love it. Yeah, we That's always appreciate uh, chess players with their puns, right? For sure. I've known Savrula for a very long time. I think we first played in 2010 in a World Youth once, and I've like more or less seen her once a year at least at some chess tournament. So in this nice. game, uh, we have... Both sides castling kingside, but it looks like Theodoru is going for this kingside attack, just completely launching all the pawns. Queen to g3, preparing for h4, h5. How do you feel about this kingside attack? Is it weakening? Is it worth it? What's going on? I mean, I think this kingside attack is pretty worth it. First of all, he is a grandmaster playing against a feeding master, so... Um, I have like a lot of confidence in grandmasters having a better handle of these complex positions, especially as we see Theodori having Theodoru having a whole minute up on his opponent. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, and he goes, he's got the white pieces, so probably is pretty comfortable. Um, how do you feel about Kapil putting the queen on a8? It's making this battery, but it is the complete corner of the board, so. It's kind of interesting how there's all this pressure in the center on that main diagonal. There definitely is a lot of pressure. Um, I think one of the ideas that Black always has in this position is pushing d5, potentially. So that's a move that the queen on a is probably gearing up for that, or e5, then d5, just so white doesn't get a pawn on e5. But I, I'm not really sure what Black's idea in this position is. Obviously, he doesn't seem to know either, because he's spending a lot of time on his move, so... Unfortunately, we can't help him. But uh, I think A takes B5 and maybe E5 or D5 is the best way to go. Yeah, obviously white just took on B5, so black's main response would be to take back, but obviously doesn't seem to like what would follow after one of the knights take on B5, I assume. Or... Yeah, because the d6 pawn is hanging, right? So you, you have to commit to d5 or e5 after. Um, I guess yeah. d5, actually, there was a fork on c7. So maybe that's why exactly. he didn't play it. And instead has now chosen to go e5, which effectively means that white is not down a pawn. Um, but, sorry, I mean, black is not down a pawn. But now this pawn is going to come pushing. And it's not like you can take on b5 because the d pawn is still really weak, so... I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. I'm liking Theodore's position a lot. This is why I'm glad that I am commentating and not playing, because <laughs> it's the player's job to figure out what to do and not ours. Yeah, I mean, I can only suggest some ideas for him. I mean, I can suggest A takes B5, Knight takes B5, and then all of a sudden this pawn is really weak, so maybe you go pin this knight and maybe you trade it off so then you can take this knight. It's so complicated with only 1 minute 30 seconds on your clock. I don't know if, you know, but either player really is familiar with the nuances in this position, but white at least has a very simple idea. White is going to push up h5, white's going to push up g6, white's going to push up h6 or something, and just go for this attack. 
it's just a pawn storm. And he's not afraid of his king because black's pieces are a little bit disjointed. The, pawn, the, the bishop and queen are still looking at the center e pawn, which is quite well protected at this current moment and is always too scared to take on b5, so. Yeah, and pushing d5 is not possible because that just hangs the knight on e5. So position's kind of awkward for black. And like you said, the plan is very easy for white. So um, maybe we take a look at another game at bird's eye view. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely take a quick look at bird's eye view. Um, once again, Benjamin is completely winning over there. Yeah. He, he kind of had a, a rough first game and maybe got a little lucky with the Rook versus Knight in game. But uh, mm -hmm. I think we should definitely take a look at that position and see what the, the computer is screaming about. And maybe we could get a glimpse at, uh, at Cole's camera. Yes. All right. Going into Benjamin's game. I mean, if Tyler1 wants to mob these grandmasters, he is welcome to sign up for a college and partake in the collegiate chess league, I'm sure. We would get a whole brand new audience if he does so. No well, it depends. There. Depends on what school Tyler One would get into or go to. Like, <laughs> uh, he might not make it to Division One, but if he gets into like Columbia or Yale, like maybe he could. So, <laughs> uh, that'll be interesting. I mean, I would love to see celebrities and pe like people mentioning Magnus and Tyler One signing up for CCL. Um, Do you think he has a higher chance of becoming a grandmaster or a higher chance of getting into Yale? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, it, I guess it depends on what department he applies <laughs> to. Uh, I feel like, I mean, there's probably, there's more students at Yale than there are grandmasters, right? Yes. So there's, it's probably, I don't know if this math works out. Am I mathing right or what is <laughs> <laughs> What is going on? Are we mathing correctly? So by so it's more likely that he becomes a student at Yale than becoming a grandmaster. I guess that's valid. So, you know, speaking of grandmasters, we'll have a quick look at bird's eye view again before we jump into um, the top grandmaster for the University of Chicago. I have no idea how many students are at the University of Chicago, but it's pretty impressive being both a grandmaster and being a student at the University of Chicago. I mean, there's only one, right? I think that one person is a wonder. No, there's Praveen. <laughs> oh, sorry. Wow. He... <laughs> my bad. He can't even have that. I forgot. Board two is Praveen. So <laughs> my apologies. Can't forget about Praveen. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a one in two statistics, <laughs> I guess. Um, but uh, oh, you, you could have said that for Cheka at Yale. He's the only GM at Yale that I know of, at least. Is he? Is he the only? Yeah, probably. I mean, at I, least in the CCL. Okay, probably. <laughs> I I he... always feel like you say something like that, and then you run into someone on campus the next day, and they're like, "Oh yeah, by the way, I'm a grandmaster," and you're just like, "Sorry, what? Like, <laughs> what's going on here?" Um, I actually I like wouldn't. I feel like you'd have to know if you're like a GM at a school. You kind of know like all the other GMs at your school. So fun fact, when I was in high school, there were three people, sorry, four people in my school that were on um, Olympiad teams. So every year, every two years, there's this huge chess event called the World Chess Olympiad. Usually the teams, each country sends their four or five best players. Um, when I was in high school, there was a girl playing for Jamaica. So I was board one for Canada. There was a guy playing for Hong Kong, and there was another girl also board like two, three, four for Canada. And this girl came up one day and was like, oh, I saw you at the World Chess Olympiad. And I'm just there like, sorry, what? What do you mean you saw me at the World Chess Olympiad? You have to understand, this is like, the, these tournaments are usually held in like Azerbaijan or Georgia or something, and it's pretty far. And I'm just like, what is happening? But... It was. Bot Soren is playing an absolute masterclass game right now. He I'm is sorry, though. You know. he, he is. He sacks the knight. Knight takes d5, and if queen takes, there's bishop c6, forking the queen and the g2 mating square, and so a wonder can't take it. And like every move that Bot Soren's playing is just throwing haymakers, and they're both He's under 10 seconds. He's going to. Um, I mean, a wonder is going to swap his opening next game. Look at this. I, Two minor pieces versus the rook. 
this is just awesome play from Botsorin's got one second though. He's got to move. He played that with less than a second on the clock. He's living off the increment. I wonder's trying to flag him. Oh my god! So hard. I mean, I wonder has all the skills, but he's got to, he's getting coming with checkmate as well. He's got his own checkmate. Oh, look at the minor pieces. Is there's like a king lock? What is this? Knight of five, so smart defending this and also attacking e three at the same time. Rook's coming to e two. <gasps> Made in two. Oh my god! Oh, remember he when I said there was ninety three? Yeah, he walked right into it. Wow, king d one blunder. I want to go back to Blunder from a Wonder. You're proud of that one. <laughs> I can tell. I, it's okay. We're proud I, of that one too. I wasn't it's all planning good. on it. It just came naturally. <laughs> no, I love it. I want to go back and point out Joe's um, excellent tactic point out here. So queen went to f3 and knight takes d5 is a double exclamation mark. Because if you play queen takes d5, for everyone watching, there is bishop to c6 with queen to g2 checkmate. Wow, so a wonder goes down. Big loss from him. Even playing a serious opening, do you think he should go back to... <laughs> yes, absolutely. He should definitely go back. Um, I mean, I don't think that... You know, playing against grandmasters and playing subpar openings is a very good combination. But I also do think that, in his mind, if he is losing this game, then why doesn't he just play a crazy opening? Because he might have a chance of losing anyways. At least that's how I would think about it. Well, we're back to bird's eye view. We have two more results and one final game left, which just finished with a Bach win. So um, the score is still in your favor right on pace for that 12-4 score and it's the same pace that we saw in the previous match with Yale's uh, loss to UTRGV so um, the score is 2-6 to six right now both rounds have been 3-1 wins for SLU this time the win coming from Praveen for the U Chicago team with a Wonders first loss coming to Bot Soren so how do you feel about this match so far Nemo? I mean, I think it's a lot of fun. I think we've been having some really exciting games. We've loved a Wander's opening choice, and we've also loved a Wander's normal opening and Batsurin's excellent tactical play. So I think the games themselves have been extremely exciting. Obviously, this matchup was predicted to be one-sided for a slew, um, but you know, there's two points. A Wander has a point. Praveen has a point. It's some exciting things. I mean. I don't know. What do you think is going to happen once the top boards play each other for the second half of this match? I mean, I'm really excited to see how Awander and Praveen are going to play against Bach and Theodoru. I think everyone here has known or watched Bach's streams, and so we've got a lot of Bach fans in chat, I know. But obviously, Awander and Praveen have a lot of talent. They've already gotten some wins here today, both against Gabby. So um, Gabby's going to try to do better in the second half against Chicago's lower boards. But the lower boards are also going to try to get some points as well from Chicago. So I'm really excited to see if maybe we can get the score closer to my prediction than yours. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what really matters at the end of the day, right? Um, but... Regardless, this match has been really exciting. I hope you guys are as hyped as we are for the second part of this. The games are only going to get stronger. I mean, SLU is stacked, but Chicago is not shy to punch back. So we'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Grandmaster Anish Giri, and welcome to Latin Repertoires 24. This so-called Latian Gambit is horrible. F5, Knight takes E5. This is not how chess is played. He played too many moves with pawns and the queen, um, and didn't develop his light pieces. And if Knight E4, this is a very important trick to remember. Many people fall for it, actually. Knight to B5, brilliant idea. A, B, and Queen G7. And after Rook of 8, Bishop H6. Queen C5 and F3, and surprisingly, Queen F2 is almost checkmate, but it's not. 
your opponent wants to be solid, we go for uh, the aggressive for the kill. If your opponent wants us to go for the kill, we play simple chess. And just use the fact that we have more space in the center, clear cut plans, and uh, nothing uh, to worry about. Today we're going to go down into the New York City subway, set up a table on the subway platform and see if we can get some strangers waiting for their trains to play chess with us. All right, now I'm going to see if I can get anybody. Sounds like he knows what he's doing a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not that good. Yeah? You're just out here playing chess, not that good. Got the chess.com app. Do you ever play on your phone? Oh, yeah. He said he barely played. I'm a teacher. What do you teach? Chess. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Self defense. How do you stay sane? Uh, I used to do a lot of meditation. Take medication. <laughs> What's like lesson 101 of self defense? Run. What are you listening to right now? Train. Sean Paul, Ed Sheeran. What is the meaning of life? It's funny because like what I'm doing, I feel like doesn't align with my philosophy on what the meaning of life is, but it's like obviously spend as much time with family as possible. The best person you can be, get closer to God, not to be evil to each other. There you go. Good game, thanks for playing. Uh, good, good game, game thanks brother. for playing. Appreciate it. I'll see you in a self-defense class. Enjoy Harry Styles. Welcome back everyone to the Collegiate Chess League presented to you by SIG. We're currently watching SLU, St. Louis University face off against Chicago. And Joe, what are your predictions for the second half of the match? Well, if I'm trying to stay true to my overall match score, I guess I'm hoping that the second half, Chicago is gonna get at least three points out of eight games. I think we're all expecting SLU to win. Uh, but the question is, by how much? The question really is, by how much? I mean, I'm personally going for that, you know, 12 to 4, and we can still see that happen. Um, SLU just needs to win three, I can do math, three games for both of these um, rounds. So that can definitely happen. But, you know, we've seen some really exciting chess so far. We have the game starting. We're going to be seeing a wonder play against Benjamin. I'm personally really excited for the, these next two games because we're going to see a wonder against Benjamin as well as Praveen against Nicholas right now. And then the next game is going to be a wonder against Nicholas and Praveen against Benjamin. So top grandmasters. There are a lot of grandmasters in this tournament and we're seeing some of the best ones play right this second so if you're not excited chat i don't know what you're doing yeah anytime chicago is playing up against a scholarship school it's exciting because that's the top talent chicago is the strongest non-scholarship team and they've definitely had some awesome upsets in the past and um they're actually one of the few schools that have won a ccl championship in fact chicago is the only non-scholarship team in the CCL 
to have won a, a championship. So um, it's always a pleasure to watch Chicago, thanks to a wonder and his number two, Praveen. Uh, but also they have talent on boards three and four as well with uh, Kapil and Cole. So yeah, let's dive right into these games. We have the top board starting uh, for Chicago and he's playing against Bach. Yep. And Bach has actually taken a page out of a Wanderer's book and is going for the double Fianchetto. So I kind of like that. I kind of like the double Fianchetto. We saw a uh, Wander play this last game against. Um, sorry, I'm. I, I do not want to mess up his name. Butzerin. 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 Okay, Butzerin. Uh, and I think that it's going to be a really exciting game. I'm sure Benjamin is going to be playing this perhaps slightly more accurately than a Wander did. A Wander left a lot of weaker light squares in his position, but. Um, we're not seeing that right now. A Wanderer has chosen to take a longer route with his knight and is probably going to go for knight to c7, followed by an eventual e5 at some point. Just taking a quick look at their ratings, Bach is a huge favorite with two rating point advantage over a Wonder <laughs> after his last uh, loss to Batsurin. Yeah, this is going to be a really intense game. Um, so we are going to be here for a bit because last game, I feel like I didn't do a wonder justice with his match against Batsuren. And this time we are going to be here and see if he can come back from his loss. Yeah. And he's playing against Bach. I wonder if we have like a head to head lifetime matchup from chess.com. Like obviously these players have played before, not only in the CCL, but I'm sure like just in general, like everyone loves to play against uh, streamers and I'm sure they've played in like, they? other instances. Oh yeah, do you do you ever play against viewers Nemo? I mean, I play against my viewers, but my viewers don't love playing against me. What? <laughs> or at least my subscribers don't love playing against me. I'm always whenever I do like sub Sundays or something, people are like eh <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> like I wish I was joking about this, but I get like 10 signups or something for sub sunday and I, I i i don't just have 20 subs you know so i just want to point that out <laughs> not everyone wow. does you hear that chat you guys got to pick up your game nemo needs more challengers on sub sundays so apparently i do yeah <laughs> apparently well, i do i wait so have we played nemo recently What's have we played ever? We must have. If we haven't, we can make it happen. I don't know I'm if I'm down subbed. to play. I think, I think I'm subbed. I should sign up. I'll be the first to sign up for Sub Sunday. I'm tomorrow? down to do an adoption match tomorrow if you want. Adopt you're gonna adopt me, Nemo? Aren't In you what like time control? Bullet? <laughs> bullet? I would I would definitely What's your bullet rating? Adopted. Tell us, please. My bullet is like twenty two hundred. It's probably really close. Yeah? Yeah, it's probably really close. I don't know if I can adopt you. I'm not going to say it confidently, but... Do people I, do, do they have the math on what rating difference you need? I think for... it's about, like, 300 points to adopt. I'm about, okay. like, 250 points higher rated than you. 250? Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's really close well, on the, I'm... like, pure theoretical odds of me being able to adopt you. <laughs> I'm probably pretty rusty, but I think like over 10 games, like it's hard to win all 10. It is, yeah. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I got adopted by uh, Sasha Bornick um, last weekend in 1 0. Well, but yeah, he couldn't adopt me in 1 1. Ah. So we did a 1 0 1 as well, but he's like. 700 points higher rated than me but yeah, Bornick's a thousand a points higher okay maybe he's even a thousand points higher rated so yeah Bornick you know? is a uh, different different kind of class of player uh hey speak for yourself pocket money or speak for joe joe is 2200 bullet i'm at least 2450 bullet thank you very much <laughs> i will take offense to that comment i take my bullet rating very seriously just ask donya 
And adoption is winning 10 games in a row. So it's yeah. really difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would get adopted by either of these players, but that doesn't mean that we can't commentate on their games. Obviously, you're saying that you actually know a Wonders family and um, you remember when he needed help tying his shoes. But now it looks like he doesn't need any help playing against Benjamin Bach here, although position might be in White's favor slightly. He absolutely does not. I mean, he has his bishop on e6, and um, I, I don't love his position. It feels really passive. This feels like an opening that you play, hoping that your opponent's going to overpush. But I think Benjamin is a well-seasoned grandmaster and is familiar with how to not overpush in these positions and simply convert his strategic okay well i said that and then he also played 95 and i think 95 is actually a positional mistake because a bishop takes e5 pawn takes and now all of a sudden your bishop is facing this pawn on e5 um and there's knight before coming in so i don't love 95 i think 95 is actually a strategic mistake yeah that's really interesting because uh, a lot of players don't want to give up that fiend color bishop especially when your opponent still has that same color bishop so um Bach is kind of testing a wonder if he will take, and even if the computer is recommending that to be the best move and strategically the the best for the long run. I, I think, think it just looks good for the position. I think the bishop is just going to look terrible on b2, and he does yeah, do it now. wonder does it. So it's not the most uh, like natural move that people kind of do when you give up a bishop for a knight. It's, it's tough to justify, but like you said, this is um, looking at the structure now. Uh, results in a favorable position for uh, a wonder. So maybe he can convert it. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is just one of those positions where, once again, we're going to this end game. There is going to be a very slight advantage for a wonder because the pawn on c4 is actually going to hang, but it's just not like that big of an advantage in the end game with your opponent having pair of bishops and half open files. End yeah. games are tough. I definitely Bye. think a wonder can convert it, though, because uh, Bach is feeling the pressure and also slowing down on the clock, which is getting more and more significant as the time runs down. Yeah. I think that this endgame is going to be really insightful. We've seen a lot of really insightful chess, and honestly, I've been learning a lot doing these commentary sessions with Joe. It's been wonderful. This has given me every excuse to like study chess and look at grandmaster level games again and i love just you know having well i don't have more time than the players but because i'm not playing the game i can look at the board with more of like a bird's eye view i would say and i'm just like so in this position you know white has this half open file so naturally it's he's gonna go for it he's going to give up this pawn on c4 but white also does have their pair of bishops so he's going to put plenty of pressure on b7 he's going to utilize his bishops to put pressure on c6 because this rook on b8 will eventually be pinned and what is black going to respond to that and these are really fun thoughts to have in an end game i like this uh doubling on the b file idea that you pointed out for bach but uh it does ask like well a2 would be hanging with tempo um White's putting pressure on the knight on d3, so that ties down uh, a wonder's bishop on c4. Um, but also, I'm wondering, like, if we double on the b-file, maybe black has, like, some bishop b5 idea, trying to lock in that rook. It's hard to play bishop b5 in this specific position, because rook takes the knight falls, but rook to a6, um, kicking away this rook, which is very well placed, is an absolutely great idea. And swapping off the rook helps a wonder a lot because when you are up a piece sorry well up a pawn in this case and also have some weaknesses you want to trade off pieces right because the less pieces your opponent has the less pieces they have to attack you wow logic and also the less pieces they have to counter your pass pawn yeah so trading off that rook alleviates a lot of pressure on the b file um and as you mentioned uh, there's no bishop b5 because of the exchange sack leading to the win of material because you get two minor pieces for the rook thanks to box well-timed bishop f1 which is an underdeveloping move but it, it pins the knight so um really well placed piece even though it seems awkward you're not being cut out anymore uh but how does bach actually 
uh, take advantage of this pen? I mean, I think it's really hard because you sort of have to like wrap around uh, to to do it or use your rook. I, I just don't think it's possible, but at least the wonder is feeling some of the pressure here and it's going to give up the b7 pawn in order to be able to move his bishop. There's also knight takes e5, which defends the bishop, so... Yeah, that is a really common tactic, and he's playing it. So it looks like the knight's hanging. Um, yeah. But then there would have been, I guess, rook d1, pinning the Correct. bishop. Yep. So we see this trade of pawns and minor pieces. And now Bach is under 10 seconds, so he's really got to put it to a higher gear here. He really does. Um, I'm concerned about Bach's time usage. It's one thing to have four seconds against Kapil, who is a Fide master. It's another thing to have four seconds against a Wander Leong. So, I am not entirely certain that this is going to be a comfortable position. I like that a Wander is not just blitzing out the moves. He is spending a little bit of time to calculate the best way to proceed, and he cashes in that check, Rook D1, and gets on the C file, attacking the bishop. And now Ooh, he's setting up a little trick there with rook takes c6 and knight takes e3 with a discovered, but he might have cooked a little too hard because now there is bishop c5. And now the c6 pawn and the e7 pawn are both hanging. So sometimes in endgames, you do actually want to play fairly simple chess. He overcooked the position. I mean, we got the chef of wonder in the kitchen. <laughs> we really uh, do. We really do. Looks like he's... Uh, burning some pawns perhaps yeah but i mean he still is the one with the pass pawn and having a pass pawn is much more important than having any extra pawns well okay i don't want to go as far as to say that but having that pass pawn is really nice uh-oh a wonder's position is getting much much better here and bach is down to two seconds Ooh. Ooh. oh my god he made that move one second on his clock oh my gosh well black is just going for checkmate Wonder is just trying to check me. He's not even... Well, I, I guess he is also trying to promote, but... Pawn push. Rook d2 is the threat. How do you stop it? Rook d2 as well as c2. It's unstoppable. I, yeah, there's there's two different checkmates, and... A Wonder is actually going to take down the win. A Wonder takes wow. down Bach, and we can take a look at the bird's eye view to see the rest of the results coming in. We have... Um, well, it's looking good for my prediction. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, we have uh, two more points for SLU uh, so far. And it looks like Kapil, though, for Chicago, that's going to be good for my prediction, actually, um, if we want to take a look at that game. What was your prediction again? 11? 11 to 5. So Ooh, I would need way if, too if, many points in the if last Kapil, round. If Kapil wins this, you need a sweep from the SLU team. Yeah. And if Kapil wins for my prediction, I only need one point. From it's okay. Kapil can throw. Oh, no. I think Kapil's going to convert. Uh, but interestingly, Chicago might prove both of us wrong and score more than is... a point in the fourth round. Yeah, this is also actually a draw because the rook comes back. Sorry, I I, I love these endgame nuances because now you can go rook b8 to defend, whereas the other way that you played it or um, Gabriella played it, there's just no way for her to defend. So now it's completely lost and she resigns. Yeah, and you can see the look of frustration on her face. Uh, not the best for Gabby this, this uh, match, but the good news for her is that her team is doing well. In fact... They're at eight points, so they're guaranteed at least over time uh, if they lose every single game in round four, which I don't think anyone is expecting that unless you're like a diehard Chicago fan, <laughs> uh, which I know there are some of you out there. So uh, Chicago needs a sweep to force overtime. Otherwise, Slu's going to win this one. I still have not learned how to pronounce Chicago. Chicago. It's <laughs> Chicago, well, not well, Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was pronouncing it Chicago. I've like never yeah. heard this. I, I don't know. Have you heard of Chi Town? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> That's Chicago. <laughs> Chi Town? <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean, any any Chicago natives want to tell us a little bit about the city of Chicago? I'm learning 
American slang from my American compatriot here. I love it. So it's Chicago. Not yes. Chicago. Chicago. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so Chicago has deep dish pizza. I'm sure you've heard of that, right? I do not like deep dish pizza. Oh, so you've had it. I have. I'm a huge Ooh. fan of like European style, like thin base pizza. So we see uh, some interesting night moves. Uh, the Theodoro is perhaps seeing a bit of a play <laughs> style and is giving him a taste of his own medicine here. Oh my god, I cannot believe it. They are Theodoro has what I would describe as a smile on his face. Oh, Theodoro doesn't show smiling. a lot of emotions, but uh, I love it here. This is great. So you think Theodore is perhaps sending a message? Definitely sending a message. So for context, for those of you who might not know, um, I wonder last week played 96, 98, 96, 98, 96 as like his opening. That was his opening for two games. Or three or four. I don't even know how many, but he, that's like what he did. And then he also played A4, A4 stuff. So anyways, um, Nicholas has had enough and he's like, I'm not going to let you take all of the attention and I'm going to do the same thing. Well, Theodoro may be trying his luck a little too much because Bishop C5, it looks to me like you can just grab on E5, no? I think so, yeah. I am not entirely sure why Bishop takes E5 is not possible. Um, there's no deep reason. And I'm sure Wonder is also wondering after Bishop takes E5 if there's anything like Queen D7, which is probably what he's most likely worried about. But Bishop B2... Knight takes e4, and you can just castle because once you castle, now all of a sudden there is this pin, and the knight on h3 sneakily defends the pawn on f2, completely unplanned for sure. When a wonder decided to develop unoptimally, so you know it's great. We love it out here. Yeah, so a wonder does take, and instead of going to that e file, Theodoro just plays d6 calmly, opening up for his light square bishop. And maybe you get some compensation after taking on h3, but I think that Theodore probably doesn't want to damage that pawn structure because with it, a wonder will get that open g file right at Black's King. Yeah. I don't. Well, I still like Bishop takes h3 just because I feel like if you're playing down a pawn against a ground monster, you're definitely not going to get there without making some sort of, you know, play at some point. So. Uh, I actually personally like bishop takes h3. I don't think we're going to see that here. Um, White is going to attempt to defend e4. He he for sure is not going to short castle in this position because there's queen e2 and then long castle. And I think that's the best way to go. Yeah, I I wouldn't take on h3. I, I would be too scared of rook g1. And uh, this bishop on b2 on the long diagonal is going to be a beast in the long run. So... We do see that queen e2 idea, and I definitely agree with you. Castling queen side is going to be the way to go. Um, castling king side, then I would want to take on h3, perhaps. Although, wonder still would have king h1, rook g1. So, um, yeah, I I would I would prefer a wonder's position here. And Theodore is playing with fire, starting with a wonder's opening. So, wonder's going to try to make him pay and say, I'm the only one that can play knight a6 uh, like five times in the opening. I'm just personally happy that they have gone off the rails and are not playing, you know, 30 moves of Nydorf theory for like the 10th time because I've seen plenty of that at top level chess. There's a lot of amazing chess tournaments going on these days. There's a lot of very strong grandmasters playing um, uh, with, you know, obvious implications, but this is like anti-theory. We're in the collegiate chess league, guys. We're having fun. <laughs> That's what matters for chess sometimes, at least. I we mean, can leave the top super grandmasters just do their thing and have their discussions. And we can just be here and, you know, enjoy whatever the heck happened in this opening. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's fun either way. Like, these players, obviously, the, the match results is going to be a win for SLU. Um, barring some insane miracle, it's not mathematically impossible yet. But uh, <laughs> if we were, like, in the playoffs, like, I don't think they would be playing this way. But, I mean, maybe they'll prove me wrong, which 
you know, we've seen some crazy things in the past. Uh, but obviously, it's fun either way. I think playing seriously or playing these openings, uh, the players are just having fun, like you said. And yeah. ultimately, that's why we do this, right? It's like the players are having this opportunity to, to show off their skills or to mess around, but ultimately competing for their school um, and uh, see like what happens and, and who's going to win. Absolutely. And I, I once again think that Joe's point is very valid. Don't forget, guys. It, well, look, not saying it's not possible, but University of Chicago has a very tough uphill battle if they want to tie slow. So, I, I, and assuming that, I think Nicholas is also choosing to play this opening because he knows that his team doesn't have that high chance of losing. Once again, things can look very, very different if... A Wander and Nicholas meet each other, for example, on round one of the World Cup or something like that, right? I, I, don't, I don't imagine we will see this opening played there, but because of the current situations and because of the nature of also their schools, hey, what's wrong with a little fun? And Chicago and SLU have played before. Um, and uh, again, Chicago has won a CCL championship, so... Um, they know what it takes. SLU, meanwhile, they have the most CCL championships under their belt with two, the most of any school. So both of these teams, they are no stranger to winning, and they know when to play seriously when they need to. And uh, even if the openings are not serious, the players and the match still is. So I'm excited to see uh, how the rest of this match is going to play out. And uh, we will have a player interview afterwards so uh definitely we want to stick around to see how that goes so is there anyone that you're excited to maybe get to to talk to maybe uh Biodoru that you mentioned that you've known um, yeah definitely we've we've heard thoughts from benjamin we've heard thoughts from a wonder but i do want to hear his thoughts on this very last opening that he played because Nicholas isn't really the type to do this so I, I do want to hear his thoughts because I, f I feel like he's not he's playing this because he's feeling very confident his position is currently um looking you know it actually doesn't look that bad it looks like Nicholas is pushing and he does have th three minutes whereas a wonder only has one but that doesn't change the fact that a wonder is just up upon you know yeah d5 is a really good move from Theodora, obviously that e pawn is pinned uh, by the rook. Um, so I wasn't sure how I wonder would respond to this. He plays knight g5, but you can definitely see that he is a bit uncomfortable. He's leaned forward. He's really focusing and paying attention here. And you can tell by the time usage, he is under a minute. And Theodoro, meanwhile, has over twice his time. Yes, I think uh, Nicola is deaf. Uh, wow, I love h4, but this was actually not the right move here. Um, well, not the best move, I should say. There's some pretty crazy tactics going on with knight takes d5 and knight takes d5, followed by queen to h5, because now if you take this knight, we were threatening f7. There's e takes d5, and there's checkmate, so... <laughs> Uh, I wonder always has these positions where there's just some crazy tactic that works out for him. He misses yeah. it this time, but he's still going for something crazy. The sacrifice of the knight. He's going for what's called a fishing pole tactic. And he does open the H file, so Theodoro accepts it. And now what are we seeing? The knight's on E4, attacking everything. There's pins. There's trades about to happen. I don't think you can avoid this. So what's the follow-up from a wonder here? He's got less than 20 seconds. I think he just has to take this knight, right? I, I, there, there's just nothing else you can play, like, quite literally. Um, and then just move the queen over and go for checkmate and hope your opponent doesn't see it. Wait, <laughs> oh, nine seconds well, on the clock. <laughs> so queen f4 is another piece of <gasps> sacrifice. And that's why he doesn't do it. He goes rook h4, and now Theodoro has a chance to, to come back. Theodoro more than just has a chance to come back. He has the opportunity to develop his last piece, which is the bishop from c8. Now the rooks can see each other. Now they're the rook bros. And this bishop is defending this key square on h7. And there's all these ideas with g6. And this bishop can come back. And it's all sorts of a disaster for uh, a wander over here. 
Well, speaking of rook bros, a wonder has his rooks doubled up, and now he's pinning the bishop to the queen. Right. I mean, once again, a wonder is playing down a knight because he used the fishing pole in order to open up the H file. So he does need to prove something here. He needs to prove that he has compensation. And um, like I was saying, with the bishops now, there's g6, which just defends h8. Wow, g6 looks like a scary move to make. You're weakening the king, but you're utilizing the bishops to defend and uh, really nullify the threat of the rooks. So a wonder's down a piece. Um, g6, it's not the... the easiest move to find but it's definitely uh, the move to top. find it's the move to find it's a candidate i think theodore is going to find it. he's got a ton of time a wonder's got 11 seconds so this is going to be really tough to convert he finds it and now what does a wonder do a wonder is just in a world of pain right now he's going to he has to keep up his attack there's nothing else he can do. His six seconds. If he swaps up anything, he is going to be worse in this end game down a piece. So your only chance in this position, when you have six seconds on the clock, or in a worse position, or down a piece, is to keep on attacking and hope that your opponent makes a mistake. And this might actually be something that we're looking for. Not saying that this is necessarily a mistake, but after bishop takes, which um, a wonder makes with one second left on his clock. There's rook takes f5 after queen takes c3, and this is exactly, exactly the type of messy blitz position that a wonder is looking for. Oh my goodness. It's so tactical. So rook takes threatening queen to g6, which isn't checkmate because of queen g7, which is played right now. But now he's threatening to win the queen with rook g5. But this extra piece coming into use with knight to g uh, knight to e7 def with knight to g6, defending the g6 pawn, so... So Theodore is just up that knight, and knights are some of the best defenders for kings. Uh, I wonder if finds a check. Is it going to be enough? I unfortunately don't think anything in this position is enough short of a big blunder. But we can see that happen, because Nicholas has 13 seconds, so... There your rook bros go, trading off. That's not great! When you're down on ma material, you yeah, do not, not want to be swapping up pieces. But there was there was really not a good way to to prevent that from happening. A wonder is so low on time. He's losing in the position. He's trying to find something here. I yeah I I I think this game was uh. Whew. It's tough playing these type of games when you are playing with increment every single okay that was that was wow. cool that was a pin by the way that, that was, was not fancy. a free rook yeah not a free rook for everyone what a maneuver what a maneuver just impressive stuff by nicholas i mean it, it, they're both grandmasters they both know they're plenty good at chess they don't need compliments from us but we're going to compliment them nonetheless because nicholas has played an astonishingly accurate defensive game without look a lot of time too so look at theodoro putting all four pieces on the e-file yeah. Getting a queen trade, rooks forking the pawns with check, resigns. Wow. Wowie. What Love to see it. And yeah, Theodoro, job done. He gets up and a wonder is out of there. Camera off. He's done. Uh, he, he gets a taste of his own medicine. He loses to his own opening. Yeah, for sure. I We're... Whew, that was, uh, a wonder has definitely taken some tough losses today. He also lost earlier against Batsurin. So. Ooh, I'm off by a half a point. So your prediction, unfortunately, doesn't come true. Mine <sighs> doesn't either. We should have guessed right in the middle. <laughs> uh, well, so Cole gets a win on board four. So that's a rough day for, for Gabby um, from SLU. But luckily for them, they get the job done with uh, the win on board one, a draw on board two, and we see the final game ending in a draw as well. So I believe that brings us to a final score of six to, wait. <laughs> math, six math to is 10. hard. Yeah, six to 10 sounds about right. And you guessed 11 to five and I guessed 12 to four. So it was closer than both of our predictions, which is crazy. Um, and I do think that we've seen some truly tremendous play. I I was very entertained the whole time. Of course. I mean, 
Whenever A Wonder is playing and whenever Slew is playing, it's a recipe for entertainment. And obviously this match did not disappoint. Uh, it was in Slew's favor, for sure. But it was still a very close match. This might have been uh, Slew's closest match so far. They are undefeated and this ties them with Dallas for the lead. Uh, but just looking at the overall player performances, huge shout out to Theodoro getting the four for four. Uh, perfect score, taking down a wonder uh, who led Chicago's team with two points out of four. And uh, yeah, what are your final thoughts on this match, Nima? I mean, I think that matches were extremely exciting. I think that uh, having the four out of four player come on for interview is also going to be fun. So make sure you guys are actually preparing some questions that we can ask Grandmaster Nicholas Theodoru. If you want to type those in the chess.com chat or my chat, feel free to do so. But this match too today has been full of excitement. Um, it was a little closer than match one. So I personally really enjoyed it. I think watching those Grandmasters play was extremely exciting. And Wonder is always so much fun to watch, just like you mentioned. And I don't know. This just means that we ha we're halfway through the Collegiate Chess League, right, Joe? Yeah, we're over halfway. There's seven weeks in the regular season. This was week four. So there's only three weeks left uh, before we start playoffs. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy that we're already basically halfway through. So all of these teams are gearing up. They know what's on the line. And we're actually going to go on a quick break, but stay tuned because we'll be back with an interview with Grandmaster Nicholas Theodoru. Let's check. Let's check. Let's check. Let's check. Let's check. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you say anything. Madonna played extremely well, very, very solidly. Didn't make mis didn't make mistakes and made good positional moves all the time. Uh, the last time I was wiped out by a woman was by Nona Geprin Dashvili in 1966. She beat me. She beat you. Two, wow. two wins and one draw. Nice. Yeah, I'm retiring.
Welcome back, everybody. Today's matches were brought to you by SIG, and we can see that St. Louis University has been absolutely killing it with four out of four on their matches and 50 total game points. That's a lot of game points. Speaking of perfect match scores, we also have the man of the hour, Grandmaster Nicholas Theodoru, who is joining us with a perfect four out of four score for today. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for joining us. You've defended beautifully against a wonder that last game and, you know, even gave him a taste of his own medicine with your opening choice. So we really want to hear what inspired that crazy decision against a Grandmaster, no less. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I've been um, following his games throughout the season. So, I mean, I know he likes playing these unusual setups. So I thought I, I could like do the same thing, basically. And I even offered him a draw um, at the start of the game because I was like playing knight b8, knight a6. But it looks like he didn't want to take it. So, I mean, I, I didn't mind, um, you know, um, getting a fight. That makes a lot of sense that you've been studying his games and preparing for that. And obviously you guys are perfect four for four right now, but your three toughest matchups are still to come, starting with next week against UT RGV, followed by the other Texas school and finishing in week seven against your Missouri rivals, Mizzou. How much prep do you guys do and how do you feel that you'll do in those matches? Oh, I mean, I don't think um, any of us do any specific prep for these matches. We just sort of, um, you know, um, try to play um, as well as we can. And it's been paying off so far as we, we have a perfect score. Um, well, I think going into the next round, we're the favorites. Uh, we have a very stacked team this year with um, four GMs. Uh, actually, one of uh, one of my teammates is playing Qatar, um, so he wasn't able to make it today. Uh, he was actually playing Hikaru, in fact. But uh, yeah, as I said, I think um, the other teams will have to um, step up their game if they want to have a chance. It's pretty crazy, Nicholas, that you have a teammate playing Qatar. I mean, I know that the SLU has a lot of very strong grandmasters, but out of curiosity, what are you majoring in school and how does playing chess affect grades? And how do you balance all of that, really? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, currently I'm doing my master's in biostats. I'm in my second year, um, but during my undergrad, I double majored in physics and math. So that's done now. It was um, probably not the smartest choice of uh, majors um, because I also like playing chess competitively, of course. Um, so combining the two um, definitely proved to be harder than I thought. But you know, now that I'm um, doing my masters, I'm taking fewer classes compared to um, my undergrad. So I have more time to look at chess and play more tournaments. And I wouldn't say that chess has um, negatively affected my grades. I, I'm doing quite well at school, so I'm happy about that. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Nicholas. And also, it is absolutely crazy that you did a double major in your undergrad in physics and math and are now doing a whole master's degree in biostats. That's absolutely insane and i think this is the perfect example <laughs> don't tell my parents that you can be a grandmaster and also excel at school so thank you once again very much nicholas we do have week five coming up this has been an absolutely exciting week four with the slew team with joe here and i think it's also really interesting hearing everybody's personal experiences with chess and school so Joe, take us away with week five matches. Week five matches are coming up. This is the second half of the season. So the match is gonna get a bit more interesting and more stakes on the line with the playoffs coming up right around the corner. We have Yale versus Mizzou. That's a big one. So we saw Cheka earlier today. They're gonna have to shape up to play against one of the tougher teams. Uh, we have Virginia versus Columbia. 
Both those teams are trying to get into the playoffs, so those are really big points on the line. And then we have the two powerhouse teams, UTRGV and SLU. We saw both of them win today, so we're definitely going to have to keep our eyes out on that one. And then we have Chicago with a, a redemption against Dallas, perhaps, next week. Dallas, uh, again, one of the perfect teams in the season. So Chicago's got their work cut out for them next week. It has been super exciting watching all of these teams. I mean, we're a little bit over halfway through. We are going to have a couple more weekends of this and then playoffs, obviously. But today's games were absolutely exciting. I mean, we got to watch Nicholas give a wonder a taste of his own medicine. We got to see some crazy chess earlier today. What, were, what was your favorite moment from today, Joe? That game that Botswana played as Slew's board three to take down a wonder was absolutely phenomenal. If I could watch a, a highlight of that, I would. So that was definitely the highlight for me today. We need to get Levy or someone to cover a match or two and have some more people follow us for the Collegiate Chess League because I don't think we are doing these players enough justice on how interesting the games can be. Like, they're not playing slow chess. They are coming out here with their own opening preparation. And, you know, like Nicholas said, he is actually taking inspiration from his opponent, a wonder, and is, like, hitting him back with his own theory. So I love to see it. And I think, uh, Joe, any last words for our lovely chatters that have also been joining us the last couple of weeks? Well, you mentioned getting some other commentators and we're probably going to do just that because next week uh, you and I are actually going to be hanging out in person at TwitchCon. Unfortunately. <clears throat> <laughs> no, this will be my third time meeting Joe. Fourth. And I feel like I finally have gotten to know him. So I'm personally really excited. But yes, next week we are both going to be in Vegas for TwitchCon, which is a reminder that Chess.com does have a booth there. So uh, this was not written into my CTA. So this is just my call out. If you want to come hang out with you guys and play at TwitchCon, please feel free to do so. Chess.com staff are really nice. And there are going to be some wonderful, wonderful streamers, including myself there, as well as Andrea. Um, and I believe Davina is going to be there to name a few. So I hope you guys show up and come say hi to us. Yeah. Thank you guys. <laughs> It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> it will be a lot of fun. Sorry, that was Joe's cue for being like, yes, I'm really excited to see you again, well, I mean... Nemo. But he didn't say that, so it's fine. Instead, we will just let you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you very much for hanging out with us. This is my lovely co-commentator, Joe Bruin. He also streams. So thank you very much, Chess.com and SIG, for having us once again for the Collegiate Chess League. We will see you all next week on Chess.com, on the channel. But from us, we'll see you soon. Bye.
Yeah, 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 yeah.